Eric. Hi, Chelsea. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you doing? Thanks for having me today. I'm good. I'm so excited to talk with you today. For anyone that's watching and listening, tell everyone who you are and what you do. Absolutely. My name is Eric Dominguez. I am a keynote speaker and a communications trainer. I also do training in storytelling, emotional intelligence, and like you, Enneagram. Yay. And yes, and actually Eric and I know each other through his partner, Whitney, who is a very, very close friend of mine. And we actually have an event coming up here in April. Is yes. It 16 and 17? Yes, April. We should have this date memorized. Have this memorized. We're talking about it all the time right now. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we're co we're facilitating this event together, the two of us and Whitney, um, to to really work in uh, elevating and evolving leaders into their highest selves. So we're if anybody is interested, um, join us in April for that conference. We'll add some um, some information about that. But with the actual dates, not with the actual dates, <laughs> not just the hypotheticals. This is what happens when you get an Enneagram Seven um, leading the show. Is yeah. I, idea and it comes out of my mouth. <laughs> I love it. Um, so Eric, so what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis for you? Like, how do you, how do you go out into the world and do those, those things and cover those topics with people? Well, there's a, a few ways. First is my keynote speeches and uh, my keynote speeches are for all sorts of events and conferences. And I speak on confidence, communication, and storytelling. So what does it feel like? What does it look like to develop lasting confidence especially in the workplace. In terms of communication, uh, I train people in how to present with confidence, with power, with fun. Uh, I'm also a Crucial Learning faculty member. Crucial Learning is a global organization that trains individuals in having crucial conversations as well as uh, creating influence within organizations. Mm -hmm. And through all of those topics, I also do, uh, run uh, half-day and full-day workshops on creating lasting confidence, creating good, uh, strong communication skills, using your story to amplify your message and your mission. And then like you, I weave the Enneagram and emotional intelligence through everything that I do. I love that. I love that. And you and I were having a really interesting conversation, which is one of the reasons I wanted to have you on here because we're talking about with, with, what, I, with what I do, I'm teaching people all the time how to go out and network, right? And how to yeah. create a community around them, how to sell what they do without it making it feel like sales, you know, because sales has kind of that slimy feeling to yeah. it where like, you know, when you, when you, the stigma around sales is just not positive. And at the same time, we all have something amazing to offer. And yet people don't know that we have that thing to offer unless we are telling them about it. And so one of the questions I get asked all the time when I'm coaching people about how to go out and network is like, well, what's my elevator pitch? How do I nail my elevator pitch? And how do I sell myself through, through that. So I want your take. What is your take on the elevator pitch? Uh, I gag when I hear the term elevator pitch. I'm like, <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, because uh, just like you said, it, it reeks of the negative side of sales. I don't want to blanket term. I don't want to blanket the term sales as bad, right. but that icky feeling, it's almost like you're per pushing someone right? You meet someone in this hypothetical elevator and you need to tell them exactly what you do because it depends, you know, if, if they don't buy from you, then everything falls apart. It just feels a little too tense. Yeah. So when I get asked about the elevator pitch, the first thing that I tell them is that I don't, I don't have a scripted elevator pitch. Uh, my strategy with an elevator pitch is have them have the person I'm talking to give the elevator pitch to me about me. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. So could, do you want to run through it? This is what I would do. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. So we're in an elevator. I'm going to the 10th floor. You're going to the 14th floor. <laughs> uh, you're going to ask me, uh, what do you do for a living? Hey, Eric, what do you do for, or I don't know you yet. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you have a name tag. We're gonna yeah, I have a name tag. I have a name tag. So you, you see my Eric, name tag. Uh, Eric Dominguez, right? What, so Eric, yeah. what do you do? <laughs> Uh, well, have you ever had to give a presentation? Oh yeah. I give presentations all the time. Okay. What is the one thing that if you had a magic wand in terms of presentation that you would change about your presentations? Ooh, if I could change something about my presentations, um, I would consistently get really clear, really positive feedback on every presentation that I give. Mm, and why is that important to you? 
uh, because I want to know that the time that I spend put designing and delivering the presentation is actually is actually converting and trans and, and helping to helping people to actually shift something in the way that they're seeing things rather than just me talking at them for an hour. Like that doesn't feel like it has any impact. Right. So you're saying that you want to create an experience for your audience. Right. So that's what I do is I, A, create experiences for my audiences as a keynote speaker, but I also work with individuals and organizations to create stories and presentations that create an experience for their clients and potential clients. Oh, that's my floor. Have a nice day. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> That's so good. And so I love that too, because it didn't feel like a forced thing. You know, sometimes I think people position when they're trying to like, when they try to do that, I see people try to position it as like, let me show you how important I am. And you're going to tell, you know, but that, that yeah. felt so authentic. So talk to me about the importance of authenticity in how you, and, and probably confidence, right. Which is something you talk about all the time. So authentic, authenticity and confidence in how you deliver and have that conversation. Cause that did, even though it was a forced um, situation where right. we both got answers, right. Um, it didn't feel that way for me when I was going through that. Well, first is, you know, the, the word that comes to mind is qualifying. Sometimes we think that every human being that we interact with is a qualified potential client, and that's not necessarily the case. So I start with a question to investigate whether or not this person has the need, has the problem, has the interest, has anything to do with anything that has to do with me. And sometimes they absolutely don't. Right. The, you could have very well answered the, the question. I never speak in public and no, don't want to. And yeah. neither does my team. Cool. Then <laughs> I'm not going to, you know, I will connect with you in this elevator ride, but I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time explaining in detail what I do. Well, and that uh, might be a situation and where if someone says no, that might be a situation where you maybe give a little bit more of a traditional elevator pitch. Right. Where yeah. I help people, you know, design and um, and learn how to deliver quality presentations. Exactly. So that's the element of authenticity is making sure that you're creating a space for them to be authentic. That's why it's the opening yeah. question of how do you feel about this topic or how do you, what do you, how do you approach this? Uh, and then confidence is really just, it's, it's in terms of an elevator speech, it's less confidence and it's much more clarity, which I think go hand in hand. So when I began my speaking career, I wasn't quite clear in what I wanted to speak on and who I wanted to speak to. But now that I have that clarity, I'm able to speak it directly and clearly. And a lot of practice, I'm sure, too. Yeah, a lot of practice, a lot of feedback, a lot of uh, awkward moments for myself, uh, just a, a lot of ways to revise exactly what I'm doing. And it takes a lot of skill, you know the traditional elevator pitch is challenging because it takes a lot of skill. How do you summarize the scope of what you know and what you've experienced oh, yeah. in 30 seconds? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, been, I've been to so many networking events where that's what they do is they have each person stand up and give their 30 second or what one minute elevator pitch. And it's it's such a forced situation. You know, like if you're wanting real true authenticity and building relationships, that's the worst way to do it. And yeah. I've seen some people nail it and do a really great job because they they find a way to actually, and I, I feel like I do this, where I feel like find a way to actually give my elevator pitch with while connecting with the people in the room that I'm talking with. Yeah. Instead of just like word vomiting a bunch of information at people. Um, because I, I don't, I will tell you when I hear 10 people introduce themselves with an elevator pitch, I remember exactly zero of what was no. said. So it's not right. actually valuable. And it actually, and I think it, it creates a space where it feels really forced instead of that that opportunity for things to flow and for you to be able to like, you know, like you're in your quote unquote elevator pitch. It's it's conversational. It's an exchange of information, which is how 95% of sales conversations and networking conversations actually go. You bet. You bet. And in that, when I'm asking the questions like, what do you think about this or how have you experienced this? It's actually putting them in the, the experience. Yeah. They're putting themselves in the narrative of, oh, I do give a lot of presentations. Oh, I do have this conflict. Mm -hmm. And so that in itself, storytelling in itself is significantly more memorable than yeah. I'm a public speaking coach and yeah. then I move on. Right? Yep. Yeah. So, so speaking of storytelling, right. Cause that's your, that's your thing. That's your jam. And yeah. I see that as a friend of yours, I see that flow through in everything that you do, whether it's in um, in your networking and sales or in your, um, your keynotes or in your coaching or just in, you know, in relationships with friends, like 
how does storytelling, what is storytelling and why is that something that's such an important skill to have? Thank you for asking that question. What is storytelling? Because <laughs> so often I see people say, you know, they'll go on, you know, I'll check out their LinkedIn profile and it'll say so-and-so storyteller. It's like, well, what does that mean? Like, what, what kind of, are you an author? Are you a fiction writer? Like, what is exactly does that mean? So what would you say you do here? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so when I talk about storytelling, I'm really talking about presentational storytelling. That's my jam is how do you craft a story in your communication in a way that, as we said before, creates an experience for your audience, audience of a thousand or audience of one. And there's overwhelming brain science that says that our, you know, I love this term, our brains read stories like computers read code. We can't help it. It's, it is ingrained in us. And in the absence of a story, we fill in the details. Mm -hmm. So when I'm coaching others in storytelling and using stories to communicate their message, it's really about how are you creating that experience for them? Mm. that's that is my framework yeah. of storytelling I love that how does that transition into a networking kind of conversation the key term especially in a networking conversation but I would say that in most communication is show don't tell mm. right there obviously is going to be times when we for time purposes or context that we just need to tell here are the facts here's the list here's whatever the case may be but we're not going to remember those facts. Mm -hmm. What we will remember is you showing us. So a two minute story is going to be more memorable than here's a list of things that I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And stories can, you know, stories can happen in various contexts, especially in a networking event. Yeah, absolutely. So when, when we were doing our, 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 you know, elevator pitch and it was that your version of storytelling in networking or do you have another version of what that might look like if you're standing in a networking room with someone or you're out at a coffee with someone? How might that look a little bit different? Um, it looks similar structure is when I'm at a networking event, the the most important tool that I have at my disposal is asking the right types of questions mm -hmm. is I want to evoke in them who they are, what they're passionate about and seeing the connections between who I am and what I'm passionate about. Also be listening for how can I support this person? How can this support person support me? Even if it's just understanding what we do. Yeah. Yes. I love that. And, and it's, and it's, I'm hearing too, like a level of, of um, preparation and clarity that has to happen before you can even have that conversation appropriately. And because I yeah. see been a lot of networking events where people come in and maybe they're new to a job or they're looking for something new or they don't really know what they're needing to get or wanting to get from that that networking event or even more like they don't really feel confident about what they have to offer mm, and yeah. so people go into these exchanges with like a almost like a take 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 um feeling and I don't always believe that that's intentional I do believe that there is you know that oftentimes that happens because we don't really know what we have to offer people but what I'm hearing from you is that when when we approach conversations from a storytelling perspective and we're communicating using storytelling we have the opportunity to connect with people more deeply and actually add value and find ways that we can add value a little bit more intentionally than than just kind of word again word vomiting i hate that word but i keep using it yeah uh, you know like spewing things at people that's an even worse word <laughs> <laughs> but but both of those happen right vomiting get into these <laughs> situations I, I think there's there's two things that that came to my mind while you're saying is yeah sometimes we we get into stories. Well, I'll speak for myself is I've experienced at networking event, people telling me stories, long, long, long winded <laughs> stories. Yes. And uh, the question that I always encourage people to ask is, did they ask? So sometimes people will jump into a story without me even prompting. And I <laughs> think I didn't ask about this. Like, I don't, why am I being told this very dramatic 10 minute story about this. And so I try to ask the other person exactly, how can I serve them? How can I connect with them? How can they, I make it them at ease in this context. And again, qualifying them. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah. 
I have a very specific skill set. If I'm in a networking event, that may or may not apply to the person that I'm talking to. And that's okay. Yeah. It's totally okay. Yeah. So how do you handle those situations? I get asked this question all the time too. If you're talking with someone and they're just like gabbing your ear off and you are feeling maybe a need to, um, to pull away from that person, or maybe they're a great person, but you're ready to go find and connect with someone new. What do you do in that situation? <laughs> uh, truth be told, I give people space to, to actually talk. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if somebody is telling me a long winded story, even though I may feel a little bit captive there, there's a reason they're telling that. Mm -hmm. And that might be personal or professional. So I'm not going to be like, oh, bye. And then just zip away. <laughs> Um, but if I feel like they're, they are taking up too much of my time, too much of my energy, then I will find a way to excuse myself. I'll find, you know, oh, I need to go talk to this person. I need a refill on water. It's great talking to you. I, I make sure that they feel seen and heard. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And I agree. There's sometimes where you're like, this person just really needs to talk and I can be that person. They picked me for a reason. Yeah. I'm happy to be that ear. And there's sometimes where I I'll just put my hand on their arm, you know, like right here. I'll be like, Hey, so great talking to you. I want to work the room. I want to mingle around a little bit, but let's find some other time to connect again. That's and people hundred percent of the time are like, Oh my gosh, yes. Oh my God. I'm so sorry. I'm taking up so much of your time. And I'm like, yeah. oh, no, no, no. And there's just, you know, there's a lot of people I'd love to connect with you more, but you know, making sure that you leave it on that. Hey, I'm not leaving it, walking away because I don't like you or because you're annoying me. It's really Hey, I just want to meet some other people too. And we can yep. connect intentionally another, another time. You bet. You bet. Cool. Well, is there, do you, and maybe this is something people have to hire you to receive. So let me know if that's the case. Is there a framework that you teach people around how to do good, good storytelling or how do you teach people that? How, what's the, what's the game there? Well, that's, um, that's the million dollar question. And the, <laughs> the, the answer to the question is the same answer to the question, how do you get in shape? Hmm. Well, how do you get in shape? Well, you eat healthy and you exercise. Well, eating healthy for me and exercising for me, my body is going to be significantly different than yours, than the other persons, than the other people. Hmm. So asking like, hey, what's the storytelling framework? What's the best storytelling framework? That's an impossible question because every story is unique. And not only is every story unique, every story has a different context. So you're going to be telling stories differently. The way that I teach people, and I will send you a link to a few of my YouTube videos. So I do teach people how to tell stories with the caveat of this is the structure. So when I was uh, in high school, way back in the day, the way that I learned how to write an essay was the traditional five paragraph essay, yep. which was super formulaic and basically like mad libs, right? You just like yeah. filled in the blanks. That takes your voice out of it. 100%. But I am always eternally grateful for the teachers that taught me that mm -hmm. because it gave me that foundation. Mm -hmm. You got to learn the foundation of storytelling before you can get creative with them. Got it. To, to answer your question very, very clearly, I uh, I develop a 7S storytelling model that has all of the different components that a story must have, regardless of the context or the situation. Got it. And I'll tell you the 7Ss. I don't care giving them away. <laughs> You're like, this, so, is, this is free. Yeah, this is free. So the first five S's are traditional, what you would find in a freshman English class, right? So it's setting when, where, struggle, every story's got to have a conflict. Uh, sorry, setting, struggle, snap. So the point where the main character just absolutely cannot handle it anymore. Yeah. Shift, where they shift into success and success. Mm. So setting, struggle, snap, shift, success. Mm. The other two are spine, what is motivating the character? Mm. And then the second one is sincerity. How is your story authentic? The last two, really hard to teach. Absolutely. I was just thinking about that as you were saying that. I'm like, oh my gosh. And that's where Enneagram comes in, right? With figuring out yeah. your and your why. Um, yeah, absolutely. That is so that is so cool. Um, I had another question come to me while you were saying that. And now I don't remember what it was. It'll come, it'll come back to me. Oh, so how might different types of people 
maybe, you know, head, heart and gut related, mm. um, relate to storytelling maybe a little bit differently. So when I'm, what I'm talking about there and Eric, you know this, but for anyone who doesn't, um, there are, there are three different ways that we communicate, whether it's through our head and our logic and data and facts through our heart, which is related to emotions and story and feelings and, um, and connection. And then through our gut, which is really based around like credibility and power and, um, and action. And if you have, all of us have an orientation that is stronger towards one of those areas and effective communication, we know touches on all three of those components. And yeah. so how do, how might different types of people maybe relate differently or utilize storytelling? Maybe that's a better question. How might different people utilize storytelling differently? I'm actually, I'm going to answer your question, but I'm going to answer it with just a slightly different framing. Love it. Uh, I'm going to answer it. How does each type, so head, heart, body type, how can they stretch their comfort zone to be more effective in their storytelling? Mm -hmm. So thinking centered individuals, people who uh, lead with their head. This is me. They're, this is my type. Right, right. And this is broad generalization. So it may not necessarily apply to everybody, but for the most part, thinking centered individuals are going to get caught up in getting the story right. So they're the ones that are going to tell me, you know, what's the exact formula? Did I get it right? Did, was it perfectly outlined? And they get to release that and realize that there's no such thing as a perfect story. The perfect story is the one that you tell with authenticity and clarity. Mm -hmm. Heart-centered individuals, uh, like myself, get to edit themselves. Oh. So sometimes we tend to tell stories as an emotional release, which okay. is cool, which is great. And I actually encourage that in appropriate contexts. But keep in mind, especially when you're in a networking event, you got to think, are you telling the story for them or for you? And if you're telling the story for your emotional satisfaction, then it's probably not a story you should be telling. Yeah. If it's a story to, that says, hey, here's a connecting point. Here's something I've experienced. Here's something that I've learned. Then it's a powerful story. I do want to mention this because this is important. This applies to all types. Yeah. I always encourage people, don't share a story that is not at least 90 to 95% complete. So if oh. I'm struggling with something right now, I'm not going to share that story mm -hmm. because I'm still struggling with it. And in that networking event, it doesn't become storytelling. It becomes forced therapy. And that's not what we want. Yeah. In that sort of environment is what I'm hearing. Um, and I have a little bit of a challenge to this. Maybe. Please. Um, so one of some feedback that I get uh, from friends is that they appreciate the fact that I will tell them things that are happening before mm. because oftentimes we only see the end result for people and we don't ever actually see the struggle that it goes that people go through to get to that end result. We see the before and the after, right? It's like the when you when someone loses a bunch of weight, you see the before picture and the after picture. When they get into good shape, before picture and after picture, what you don't see is every time that they cried or had to drag their butt out of bed just to get to the gym. Every time that they that they cheated on their diet and they were in went into self beat up and spiraled out of control. You know what you don't see is that struggle in between. And mm -hmm. um and and what I hear what I, I hear that like in a networking environment that might not be the best place for those kinds of conversations. And I also know that in relationships sometimes it is potentially mm -hmm. the right place. Yeah. Two things. One is if the context is appropriate, then obviously, if you have a personal connection with the individual, absolutely appropriate to share, hey, here's how I'm struggling. The The real question comes back to who are you telling the story for? Yeah. Oh, are you yeah. telling the story for you and saying, oh, I cheated on my diet. Oh, I, uh, I messed this up. Oh, I'm really struggling. I need your, what you're really saying is I need your validation. Yeah. I need your help. I need your support. Then it's not a story worth telling. But if you're saying- yeah. I messed up on my diet or I'm, you know, really struggling with this and here's how I'm moving forward. Yep. Then the story is for the other person. Yeah. And that's so interesting because I think that that is, I'm reflecting on how I do that now. And I think that's what I do as I say, mm -hmm. I'll say something and I'll say, you know, it's really I, what I noticed about myself is that when I cheat on my diet or when I make this mistake, I totally spiral. And then when I'm, and what I'm figuring out is, is how to change that. And so it puts yeah. me 
out in the position of power rather than the other person in a position of having to coddle you. And that's the key to term too, is position of power. Are you in control of your conflict or are you looking for other people to control your conflict? Mm -hmm. That's the differentiating factor. So yeah, exactly. there's some things that I will say, hey, I'm struggling with this, I'm working through exactly. this, I failed in this. But then there's other things where it's like, no, that's reserved for my family, my therapist, my coach. Exactly. That's who I'm gonna tell those stories to. Yes, yeah, yeah. And that takes some self-reflection and some self-awareness which yeah. we all know is not something that everybody has a lot of. Um, and it's scary to do that self-reflection and that self-awareness um, re reflection. Um, so, but it's a, it's another reminder that of why that emotional intelligence work is so, so important, but I, we skipped over body types. The gut Thank type. you. <laughs> so gut types, because they're action oriented, sometimes they're going to move towards what do we do next? They're going to skip through some of the details because fortunately and unfortunately, gut types, their gut is usually very right, at least for them. And so their challenge is going to be to slow down and to tell the story in a detailed, organized fashion. Because oftentimes gut-centered gut individuals just want to give you too quick of a story and let you <laughs> fill in the pieces, yep. but that's not necessarily effective. Yes. Oh my gosh. That's so funny. So, you know, Parker, my stepson, he's, yeah. an, he's an Enneagram eight, which is a gut type. And he is like, he does this all the time. And he struggles actually in his English classes because when he writes a story or when he's writing an essay, he miss he leaves out all of the important parts because in his mind, it's so clear. It's like, so clear yeah. what the point is. And then, so he's like, and so he'll do this. He did this to us last night where he said something. He's like, he like finished a sentence that we didn't know the beginning of. Right, exactly. And then he That's... us because we didn't understand what he was talking about, and I'm like, yeah. Parker, buddy, like, I don't even, I didn't even know that you were talking to us before yeah. we finished the sentence, so I didn't hear the beginning of. So I, I, that's what I'm like. That's what I'm thinking about when you're talking about the the gut centered types, um, in their storytelling because they're like they have all the they have all the information they need. Why don't you get it? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. The term I always use is, and this can go too far to an extreme, but don't assume people know what you know. Yeah, Don't yeah. Don't assume people know what you know. Uh, another phrase that I learned from a mentor of mine that I got to say here is, don't let what you know get in the way of what they don't know. Oh. Don't let what you know get in the way of what they don't know. That's, That's probably more, more for head types of yeah, like, for sure. <laughs> don't get so complex of everything that you've gathered and all the information and experiences that you overload someone with information, just yeah. give them the introduction to it all. Yep, absolutely. I have a t I have a total tendency to do that because I I think that all of the information is equally important, and yeah, so I want not... everyone. I want you to know all of the information, and then when I edit myself, I over edit, and then I don't give you enough of the right information. And so it's really a, a like building that habit and building that that muscle of what what is actually important. How does this story come together so that you can actually be impactful and bring people along with you rather than leaving people in the dust and pull people forward and connect rather than be aloof and off in the, off in the sky. Exactly. Exactly. It's uh, the other, the other uh, example I use is book, movie, trailer is sometimes we think we have to communicate the book. Most often we're not even communicating, we're not communicating the book. We're not even communicating the movie. We're mm -hmm. communicating the trailer, which is really uncomfortable for us in our content area. Yeah. Like, why would I just give you the highlights, all the cool stuff's in the book? Yeah. But they won't come see the movie unless they see the trailer. Absolutely. And that's what's, so oh my God, I love this so much because I'm thinking about that as an analogy for networking. Yeah. Because when you meet someone initially, when you're first meeting someone and building a relationship with them, you have to know enough about yourself and what your value is to be able to share the trailer so that there is an interest in learning how and, and connecting. Like I've, I've met people before where, you know, I'll, you know, Hey, what do you do? Or tell me about yourself. And they go, Oh, I'm a lawyer. And I'm like, oh, all right. <laughs> That's, like, and lawyers, a vast thing. Like there's different kinds of law. I know. I'm like, I heard law school's hard. <laughs> like, <laughs> Like, where do you go from there? You know, because, because yeah. that's not even a trailer. That's like, it's a, that's a it's, topic it's area movie coming, you know, like there's like a thing that happened. Like it's not, yeah. even, it's not even an event, right. It's just a thing. 
And so I think sometimes when people are having a hard time in building connection or in finding or networking effectively or, or building out their, their area of expertise, that I think that that can be an area potentially for people to look at is how are you, how are you developing that trailer? So it does give people the interest to meet with you and watch the full movie. Exactly. That's absolutely it. And I'll also say this in the, you know, extending the metaphor there is I don't want to go see every movie that that's out there. Yeah. And some trailers I'm like, thanks for, thanks for letting me know, not going to see that. And that's totally okay. That yeah. Is that not every story that we tell is going to land with every person. Not every connection we have in a networking event is going to lead to something. And we got to be okay with that. Yeah. And we, we can, we can do that and we can have that, um, that boundary while also still being kind and curious and compassionate towards that other exactly. person. And it's, I think sometimes people take it personally um, when people don't want to meet with them or when they don't hire them. And I'm like, actually, it's usually not personal. Yeah. Sometimes the vibe just isn't quite right. Or sometimes it's not the right time or like not every person is meant to be in your space. So like, it's okay to, to have the trial and error uh, and set those boundaries so that you can attract more of those right people into your, into your world. Love that you said that because I, I just think of the people that I didn't hire, that I didn't enroll in their programs. And it literally was like, no, you're you're cool. Everything's fine. Right. Like you're offering something great. Just not for me, not right now, not not in this time. I actually just said no to someone this morning because it's like, awesome. What you're doing is great. I'm not ready for that. Yep. Yeah. Yes. And that's okay. I love that. Yeah. Oh, this is so good. Okay, Eric, how can people connect with you and how can we support you? How can we best support you and what you're doing in your in your business and in your life? Absolutely. The best way to get content from me is my YouTube channel. As I post every week uh, videos, multiple videos, some long form, some short form on strategies on communication, confidence, and storytelling. So that's just Eric J. Dominguez or at Eric uh, Speaks Up. Uh, I'm also very active on LinkedIn and you can find more about me on ericdominguez.com. Yay. Well, thank you so much. And if anyone needs a great speaker for your association event coming up, Eric is the bomb. And if you want to see both of us in action with our dear, dear partner and friend, I'm going to call her my partner too, Whitney. Um, you can join us on April 16th and 17th in Des Moines, Iowa. So you got the dates. That's good. We'll it. be there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Eric.